Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share this again. Thank you for Bridget putting that in before when I was not sending it to the right place. The link that I have just put in the chat for those who have just arrived is for a PDF version of the slides. Feel free to download it. It does have the links that we are going to uh, talk about, and then you can click on them. I'm not going to click on all of them. I might. Who knows? Uh, I am Ruth Fraser Davis. And I am the coordinator for Evergreen Indiana. Britta Dorsey, who is our spectacular support and development administrator, is here. Uh, Hello. You see on your screen some contact information for both of us. Uh, whatever questions that you have about anything related to Evergreen Indiana, do not ever hesitate to contact us in whatever your preferred mechanism is, uh, whether it be email, phone. Um, I do get sometimes Facebook messages and other LinkedIn messages I've gotten before. So however you need to connect with us uh, to get your questions answered or your concerns addressed, please do that. We're going to get started just with an overview of the resources that are available to you. Talk about these always when we do any type of training. Uh, in this case, we are talking to those of you who have local admin uh, permissions. This is the annual refresher, which is a requirement to retain those permissions for another year. The reason that we have that requirement, um, we haven't always, but we, we found that there is so much power in that position that we wanted to make sure that people remembered what they could do because it's very easy. I know I personally forget the things that I don't practice and a lot of things that have to do with the local admin permission, you don't do them all the time necessary, necessarily. And so it is easy to just kind of forget uh, and so we wanted to make sure uh, to remind you of those things. Also, to empower you to uh, make decisions. You are the people in your organization that have uh, power to change settings, to uh, apply permissions for other staff people, and to also do advanced management of patron accounts, um, and also to support your technical services department. Now, I recognize that um, I say your technical services department and all of those things, and uh, many of you are from libraries where you are all of those things. So first of all, thanks for doing that. Uh, second of all, that's a lot of work and I acknowledge it. Um, and third, please know that you're not alone in that. So the first resource on this list is, of course, the local administration training manual. And I, I think calling it that is a little bit, um, it doesn't give the full breadth of, of what uh, it does. It is a user manual. And um, so it's going to walk you through so many different tasks and places in the Evergreen client. Uh, Britta has done a fantastic job of, of um, creating an updated manual. This is to version 3.9, which is what we are using right now. We are going to be upgrading in January to 3.11, and there will be more update, uh, updated content in here. So one thing I do want to point out for, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for your screen, is that this is a Google Doc, and one of the uh, nice um, features of Google Docs is the use of this outline um, view. And what that can allow you to do is to navigate through here pretty quickly. Uh, another thing that um, both Britta and I live is the Control F that is going to allow you to uh, search and find different terms. We'll see if it, no, it never does it this way. Anyway, I don't, I don't look for it this way anyway. Anyway, this way anyway. That's kind of a silly way to say that. 
So this leads me to, we have the policies and procedures page um, that you can link to directly from here. Also uh, the address or the page to subscribe to the Evergreen Updates list. Okay, I wanna stop right there real quickly. Take a deep breath and say, there was a time back in the day, I don't remember exactly when this day was, but back in the day when there was an encouragement for at least one person on every member library staff to be subscribed to the Evergreen Updates list with the idea that not everybody checked email and this one person, at least one person was going to be kind of this gatekeeper of the knowledge and they were going to receive a newsletter, whatever came through that list and then they were gonna disseminate it to all the staff in the library. That's cool and in some libraries that works that way. Um, but if you get any library staff of size or you are in a library where the staff size is small, but you're all kind of on opposite schedules just to cover, make sure the desk is covered, the doors are open, that's not always a realistic way to get information. So my encouragement for you and everyone else and the information that you should disseminate is everybody that works in the library should be a member of the Evergreen Updates list. There are of course some exceptions. Not everybody has an email address that's associated with their job, but everybody that does should be getting these updates emails. And then you can kind of talk amongst yourselves about what things mean and reply back. This is an announcement only list. This is not a discussion email list. So you may have tried to reply to it in the past and just didn't really go anywhere. That's because replies don't work, but you can take questions from that and email us directly for it. There are other email lists. There's a cataloging list serve. There is um, a support list serve, a reports list serve, a um, resources list serve that's supposed to be for circulation staff. Those are all going to be listed on the communications page at the website, which brings me to the biggest thing. And that's one reason I haven't clicked through these things. The biggest resource here is going to be evergreenindiana.org. And this is where you're going to find all of those other things. You're going to find the policies and procedures page. You're going to find your training manuals and everything else. Um, if you do not make this part of your experience as a staff person um, at a member library for Evergreen Indiana, I would encourage you to do that. Take time, go through this website, see what's available. Maybe there's something that you missed, you didn't know about, whatever. Take advantage of those resources and then bookmark uh, this page. Um, I would say create a bookmark and just do it for evergreenindiana.org um, just because the pages may change, but that is that is not going to. Okay, and then I have on here, uh, of course, a link to the training server, which you can also access through here under training and the training server. Um, one thing to keep in mind about the training server, if you've never used it before, um, is that it gives anybody the ability to try out anything in an evergreen test environment or training environment. So you would not use your normal um, authentication credentials. Uh, but this is also a great place for people who don't necessarily have local admin permission but are curious about it that they can go in, they can use one of these generic accounts. Um, they can follow along in the training manual on different things like registering a workstation and learn more about that. Okay, we're gonna start with some basic navigation. For a lot of you, this is going to be just a reminder of things that you already know. You may or may not access it very often, um, but a lot of the features that we talk about when we talk about the local administration permission 
are accessed through the local administration uh, page, which is accessed via the administration menu. And I'm just gonna very quickly uh, go to this. So we're going to go through administration. We're going to go to local administration. Now, it is important to remember, especially, and for those of you who are new to the local admin permission, to know that not all of these things here do require local administration permission, and not all of the things that someone that has local administration permission can do are accessed here. So this is a little bit disingenuous in terms of where it says local administration. Um, if you're thinking about that only in terms of the permission group, uh, really the uh, local administration training manual is gonna give you a better idea of what requires the permission, but that's not even completely in line with it. One of the, the best things to look at if you want to go down this well uh, is, and I am a data nerd. I, I've just decided to embrace it. I love looking at crazy things and finding patterns. That is what a data nerd is. Um, but if you go into this staff permissions, um, spreadsheet here that's available on the policies and procedures page, you can actually go into the permission group, the local admi administration permission group, and you can see um, all the permissions that are assigned to it. Now, this is going to make most of your eyes water, glaze over, and then you'll need a nap. Um, things like actor.org unit close day create. Okay, what that's basically saying is that you can change your library's hours in here. Does that explain that very well? Not at all. But you can see that. You can also see if you, with that permission, can grant that permission to somebody else. And then this is where we're going to look at, we're not going to look at all of these, these links here. Um, that's reserved for the full local administration training, which everybody does have to take to have the permission. But once you have had it, then these uh, refresher courses are going to suffice for re retaining that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the organization settings. I have said before that really the purpose of this uh, refresher is exactly that. It is just to refresh you on the things that um, you have the ability and also the responsibility in a lot of cases um, to do as somebody with these permissions. So this is like one of the simplest, but also the most important and one of the most frustrating and all of those things. I mean, if you've been in Evergreen, Indiana long enough, when I say workstation registration, you have a feeling about it. Um, it could be a good feeling, it could be a bad feeling, it could be like multiple feelings, but there are feelings involved with it, especially if it involves clearing the cookies on your browser and or the cache. So, and I'm not gonna walk you through, this is in, the slides that you have downloaded that Britta has linked here on configuring multiple workstations, you can. Um, those people who want to generally have, if you have questions about why that might be appropriate, if all of a sudden this is a light bulb moment for you, um, ask, we'll be glad to walk you through that. This is one of those things that is allows different libraries within the consortium to basically choose their own adventure. Uh, so somebody at Shelby County may have this computer that this person works at, only that person works at it, they only do their specific role, but their role is split amongst two different things. And they, so they've decided they wanna have two workstations set up there. 
or you may be at Hagerstown and you have uh, one computer workstation that multiple people use and they all use it in the same way. Think of like a circulation desk. That could also have only one workstation, but multiple people using it. So there are a lot of ways that this functionality can be tailored for the environment that your library has. And we are always available to help you like walk through ideas for that or questions um, that you may have or something just has gone awry. Um, I've been noticing a little something in the browser. I think it's probably a Chrome update where it says that it's getting rid of my workstation, but then it doesn't. Maybe you've noticed the same thing just in the past couple of days. But I also know the workaround, which is also problematic because sometimes you're working around something that just should be fixed. So anyway, but you as local administrators, you are the people in your library that provide access to the Evergreen staff client for everybody else because only local admins, and there is now an exception to that, but I'm gonna keep saying that until I get to the exception, only local admins have the actual permission within the ILS to create a workstation, to register a workstation. And without a registered workstation, you cannot access the client. I am going to skip, skip through printer settings, except to say, I know that they are a beast. The other thing I'm going to say is they do not require local admin permission to do these things. Um, they just are located in the administration uh, menu and the workstation uh, place. Generally, and I, I think the reasoning was, generally speaking, because if you are someone with local admin permission, that's going to mean um, any number of a variety of things. You're going to be in an advanced position within your library organization. Um, you are likely going to either be the person or know the person that gets called upon to do more IT related things, more technologically um, related configurations and all of that. And, and so those things are all located in here. You may be the one that's dealing with templates, uh, printer settings, installing Hatch, whatever. You may not be, but it is important to note that those things do happen in this workstation page. The other thing that I will say is acknowledging that printing can be beastly. I, don't, I do not want to sugarcoat the fact that it can be just terrible. Uh, there, if you get to a point where you are stuck, put in a help desk ticket. I'm just going <laughs> to fine point that. Put in a help desk ticket. We may or may not be able to help you. Um, in terms of getting it exactly dialed in, we may be able to give you recommendations. We may be able to give recommendations to the person that you're working with, um, or there might be something that we need to even fix on, on our part. So uh, this is one of those things where it's very easy to get stuck in the mud, spinning your tires. And so I would encourage you, uh, if you do get stuck, just reach out for help immediately and put in a help desk ticket. We hear about this one actually a little bit less often than we did for a while. We were hearing about it a lot very often. How do I change my library hours or help desk ticket? Our library hours have changed. They need You need to do this. Um, this is not something that we do need to do anymore. You can do this. And you're gonna actually go into this really poorly labeled section. And I think that this probably, we need to update this label. Um, it means something to me, 
of course, I work at the admin level all the time. So when I say organizational units, I'm thinking about all sorts of different things. Um, but it's library, library information or library configuration. So in this case, I'm just going to use uh, Camden as the example. Um, if you click on the system level, the system level is going to not have the dash three letters following it or the branch level that is going to have the dash and three letters following it. Um, you can change the hours of operation. I believe you may also be able to change the addresses. You'll see here there's none set up here. It doesn't have to be necessarily. There does need to be for each branch um, hours as well as addresses. Um, but you can change those here. So I'm going to also then pick on, um, oh, Hussey Mayfield, because Hussey Mayfield has multiple branches. And so you can see that there is their, their main mailing, and this is going to be at Zionsville, but then they also have a bookmobile, and I'm going to actually go here to their hours. And so what this allows you to do is that for each of these different branches, uh, these can be updated and this is going to be their new Whitestown branch. So this hasn't been saved yet because it's not ready for this to go live. So insider baseball. So if you find that uh, in the OPAC, um, and let me see if I can just pop through here real quick and I'm sure I'll just click on that. So if I clicked on Adams County, if I happened to go in here and saw that these hours were incorrect, this is where they get changed. Okay, so the next thing, and this one is so important. And um, the reasons why um, are the patrons on the other side of your circulation desk. If you do not put in closed dates, what happens is that then you have the ability for um, items to become due on days when you're not open. Um, holds can expire on days that you're not open. This is also going to affect uh, grace days for those libraries that uh, do charge overdue fines. Um, it also impacts when overdue things go to lost. And so not having closed dates in the system for your library can be a problematic issue when that patient's like, well, I, you weren't even open for me to return it on that day. Uh, so you're going to access that through here, and I'm going to try to not have, I'm just going to pick on Adams because I know that they have theirs in. So you can see that they've actually entered, Adams County Decatur branch has entered their closed dates um, through New Year's Day, 2025. So they have a full year upcoming. Generally, the best time to do this um, is, first of all, there are some standard ones that may actually be in your library's bylaws, and then you can just go ahead and, and do that. All admins in a library see closed dates, correct? Um, I'm not sure that I understand. Everybody should be able to see closed dates. Um, but everybody with local admin can actually add closings. Yes, absolutely. You can all see them and you could you could edit them. Do we have to put in dates like if we aren't usually open? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, utilize the browser functionality. <laughs> And I'm going to go back into these organizational units, and I am going to uh, 
Pearson, I think that we have your dates set correctly. So let's take a look. So you can see here that uh, Pearson is closed on Sundays. So you would not have to go through and add under your close dates every Sunday. That's going to be respected by um, the close as a close date. But you can see here that uh, Thanksgiving does not fall on a Sunday. And it's on a day that they would normally be open. And so they would go ahead and add a close date. You just put the dates in on a day that you would normally be open, but you're closed because of a holiday or a special occurrence or something like that. The other thing that you can do here, and I'm going to do this for the consortial collection because I can get away from it, get away with it, not messing anybody up. So you'll see here, we do not actually have closed dates in ours. Um, I think that we might have, but for the collection, now let's say we had a freak snowstorm that was planned for tomorrow. We know that it's going to happen. I can, I'm just obviously just making something up. So when you go to enter a closed date, it is going to automatically, every single time, I'm going to do this again so that you can see what happened. It's going to have a little red thing down here. It's called a toast message. It says possible emergency closing. And then you're going to get a blue like little warning-ish that says possible emergency closing. And the reason that it does that is because it defaults to today. And so we want to have our closed dates that we know about. At least they anything that is sooner than three weeks we're going to say that's an emergency, even though emergency, of course, escalates the level of urgency. Not necessarily. Maybe we were just late doing it. But we're going to say that because we could have things that are checked out that had due dates um, that were set. And now that's going to respect it. So we're going to have a freak snowstorm tomorrow. Let me go ahead and set my date as tomorrow. Now I know if I had things checked out, there's gonna be things possibly that are due. The reason we don't have any set in here is because we don't circulate things at the consortial collection level. That's just um, to allow for the collection for high holds. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click on emergency. And then I'm gonna also click on process immediately. What that's going to do is it's going to, first of all, acknowledge that I have to get that in there. Uh, and then the process immediately is going to begin resetting due dates, adding grace periods, resetting holds to accommodate for uh, that time. Now, because we don't circulate anything, nothing shows up here. But now you can see that I have this, this um, closed date. Now, let's say that I want to close for Christmas. That is not going to be an emergency. Um, even though it still says possibly emergency. And, and I know that when there's like a special color there, it's like, oh, I did something wrong. Oh, I need to do something. You don't. You, all it's saying is, think about this. Is this further away than three weeks or four weeks if you want? It's never going to hurt to call something an emergency in this case when maybe it isn't. You get to decide that as long as it's further out than three weeks. If it's less than three weeks from now, mark it as an emergency for sure and process it immediately. So in this case, we're gonna, we're gonna close on Christmas. Since it's gonna be here. So the other thing that we can do is if you are in a multi-branch system, I'll add another one and I'm going to change this. Never works the way that I want it to. So now I'm at the system level. So um, I see April's in here uh, from Fulton County. And so I'm going to, this would be something that you could do for Fulton County. It has three branches. So I'm going to schedule as close for Boxing Day.
This is not an emergency, but because I want this to impact all of my branches, in this case, there's only one branch for the consortial collection, but imagine this was Fulton County, and then I would just click this. This is going to then apply to all of those libraries. So if I go ahead and click this here, you can see that it shows up here for the consortium collection. And then if I do this, it shows up here. Oh, I just put boxing instead of boxing day, nice. Um, and if I was doing this for Fulton County, and I'm gonna actually go to Fulton County. You can see that they have these set up for the branch. If I go to Rochester, the ones that are appropriate there show up as well. So that can be a quick way to handle closings for multi-branch system. Okay, the next thing is staff account management. And we do get tickets about this quite a bit. First of all, just a reminder that, oh, going back, that those counts that are used for work should not be used for personal borrowing. Personal borrowing by staff should be done on either a library card that has a staff card or a resident profile. Depends on your library, depends on if the library board has um, voted to allow for the staff card, depends on if you're fine free library, because that's the difference too between a resident profile and a staff card profile is that the staff card has uh, no fines associated with it. But if you're a fine free library, maybe you just want to give a resident profile type. I will say, and this is, again is, this is a, a recommendation um, that you do even if you are a fine fee library, still use a staff card as long as the, the board has approved that uh, because it defines that person as being on the staff. Uh, just so that you know, you can just quick glance, oh, this person has borrowing privileges and they're a staff member. A working account is always going to have a working profile added to it. Um, yes, and staff may or may not be residents. Uh, so if they're not a resident, they shouldn't have a resident profile. It does get a little fuzzy in there and I don't wanna get into the fuzzy, but, um, but again, the board does have to approve the use of staff cards. They may have done it, 50 years ago, um, but it is still a board action whenever that happened. If they haven't, it doesn't hurt to go through and do it again, um, or if you don't know. Staff accounts for staff members need to have a working profile. Um, if you're a multi-branch system, you may also be applying multiple working locations but their home library for the staff account should be where they do the majority of their work. Um, or if it's equal, then it should be for the main, the main branch. It is not unheard of or frowned upon for staff to have multiple accounts. Um, it is unnecessary in a lot of cases, and it is very inconvenient in a lot of cases, but it is not, and I, and I know we've kind of gone back and forth on this, but there are reasons for one staff person to have multiple accounts. And so if you have a question about that, how um, maybe their accounts are working against their workflows or something like that, um, just contact us. I mean, we, we will always give you the best advice that we can and walk you through what both the policy and technical considerations are going to be um, so that you can be better informed about decisions that, that need to be made for staff at your library. And it is different for every library. Now, of course, we do have shared policies and procedures and things like that, but there's a lot of room in there for good reason, because your libraries are all different. And so we want to make sure that it's working for you. So do not hesitate to contact us. Um, part of our support role is to give you well thought out 
um, recommendations and to work through problems with you. Okay, we'll talk about permissions. I've already talked a little bit about the permissions guide. Um, if you haven't looked at it in a while, I do recommend that you just go back and check both the staff profile matrix and the staff profile permissions guide. Um, one thing that it does do is it re will remind you and others what the training requirements are and recommendations and what different permission groups can do as well. When we are assigning uh, permission groups to a new staff working account, and this is something that local admins do, they create staff accounts for um, their coworkers, essentially the people, whether they supervise them or not. But we use the principle of least privilege, meaning that the permission group that can give you all the tools that you need to do your job, but not all the tools that are available just for the heck of it, um, is going to be the appropriate one. It minimizes liability for both the staff person and the library. And people who are working should only have the permission to do the things that they need to do for their job. We don't want people to um, wander into tasks that they're not trained for, that are inappropriate to their roles in the library um, or any of those things. And so it really um, is for the sake of, I'm gonna take a break in what I'm saying and answer Ann's question. Um, will we have two separate cards then one for work and one for us to check out books. Yes. So you're not going to actually have um, a card for work. You'll have a card, a personal borrowing card for yourself, and then you'll have a work account. But you will be getting a library card as well. Uh, and that's what you'll use to borrow things um, for your own self. Now, I'm going to throw a little wrench in that because there are also staff members in libraries who have um, their personal library card, but they also then have some type of institutional card that they may use for programming. Um, they may, well, programming is, is the big one, uh, but the programming is a huge bucket of, of ideas, um, special collections, special tasks that they have. And so they may have a library card, they may also have an additional staff account. So again, if, if you are in a place where you don't know what needs to be done in terms of accounts and cards for a specific person, for your own self, whatever, please contact us because the scenarios that we can come up with are pretty limitless and finding the right nuance within the policy and all of that um, can be difficult and can be intimidating, especially on your own if you've not done it. Um, and we're, we're happy to um, do that with you. I will, okay, I'm gonna go back to what I was saying. I was the person that wanted all of the permissions to try everything, but there are a couple things to consider. First of all, this is a production environment meaning that when I do something, it impacts the server that you are also using when you do. And so being conscientious about um, what I know how to do uh, so that I don't do something that messes it up for you is amazing. I'd rather not mess it up for you. The other part of that is, is that we are stewards of our patrons' information whether that be their address, their phone number, the things that they check out, whatever. We become better stewards as we become more experienced. We learn more about the software, where its vulnerabilities are, where our human vulnerabilities are. And so making sure that uh, the people who have the most access also have the most experience and the most understanding of how to um, be appropriate stewards of that information is very important. I'm not gonna go through how to make these accounts. This is first of all, of course, in 
the slide deck here. It is in the um, local administration training manual. It's exactly like creating a patron account, but you're not going to be using cards. Um, and you're going to be doing a few additional things, different uh, considerations. If you have never created a staff working account um, in this, you come upon it, please walk through the steps. Um, another feature that I love, it's been in production for a fair number of years now, um, is, and it has definitely cut down on the need to have multiple staff accounts, is the ability to have a secondary permission group added. Um, there are people in here, and I, I know several of you who have uh, a CAT1 permission group and then a local administration permission group. Some of you have additional um, even on top of that. And that can make work much more streamlined uh, because you're just logging in one time and you have the permissions to do the things that you need to do. It's much easier, in my opinion, to remember one login, but perhaps have multiple workstations set up for different defaults. So I'm gonna actually look up, first of all, my own account here. So I'm going to actually, oh yeah, I changed my username. I'm gonna go in here real quickly and show you. So my main permission group here is cat one. Uh, but if we get into the secondary permission groups of all these different things, I also have some other permissions and it's a weird, this, this is like the Frankenstein of staff accounts, if ever there was one. But this is the thing that I both love and hate. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log out real quickly. And from here, and this is my home computer. So these are the one, just ones I have set up here. Um, I have this many workstations set up. Uh, my computer at the State Library has... Uh, like 40. Okay, so this is the thing that I wanted to say, the exception to this. Um, only local admins can uh, register workstations. So we do have a new modular permission group. Now, this can only be granted by a local admin or above, so either help desk ticket or local admin, and it's called the, no, the non-admin management permission group, and it only has two permissions in it. Um, this would generally be appropriate to add to a CERC 1 who has their own individual account. If you have a shared CERC 1 account in your library, this would be inappropriate to add to it because we want the person that has this permission to have complete understanding of what these two permissions do because they are powerful. Remember I said that registering a workstation, while it is a simple task to do, is the key to being able to access the Evergreen database, the client from any computer connected to the internet. So once you give somebody this permission, once you have this permission, you have the ability to grant access. Now, of course, they still have to have a username and password, but if they have that, if they can also register a workstation, they can go home. I said I was working from home right now. I have a registered workstation on this computer. They can go in and they can get access to it anyway. So we only want to apply this to people who understand, who are trustworthy, who have signed their code of ethics and understand what it means. Um, and then they also have the permission to merge users. Keeping in mind that merging users is something that can only be done outside of this module permission group by local admins, and it can only be done for local accounts. If you want to merge accounts 
from one system and another and another system, you're going to need to, of course, fill out the uh, merge request form that's available on the evergreenindiana.org web website. Okay. This never happens. And so I don't even know why we're talking about it. But every now and again, we hear rumors of somebody leaving a, la a, a library. Here's what you do. If they use a shared account, CERC1, CERC2, CAT2, these things exist. We know that they do. The password needs to be updated on all of those shared accounts. If they did not use a shared account, well, or if they did, but they also had their own individual account, the password needs to be updated on that account and that uh, working account that belonged to that person needs to be expired. We do not delete or merge working accounts. They have implications for things that are in the database that we want to be able, we want to be able to have the right data connected to the right things, whether it be transactions or bibliographic records or whatever. And then if they have a personal card, that staff card, um, we're going to transition it to whatever the appropriate um, account type that is. Now, I do want to remind you that if it needs to be um, transitioned to a non-resident card, they have to pay a non-resident fee. So in those cases, if they have a personal account, but they don't fit into any of the uh, profile types, then they're just going to have their account uh, expired. Even if they have things that are checked out, remember, because they can still return those things with an expired account. And then if they want to pay for a non-resident card or get a plaque card or something like that, they can do that. Um, or if there are reciprocal, borrowment, reciprocal borrowing agreements um, in force, whatever. Are there any questions about what to do with a staff account when staff leave? Uh, and I will say too, um, when it says update password, what I do for this, and this is what, I, whenever I get a help desk ticket or an email, and Britta may do exactly the same thing or something subtly different um, about somebody leaving and needing to deactivate their account. What I do is I press the reset pin button I go to the expiration date and I click today and go the day before today and I press save. And that immediately expires the account and it uh, resets the password. And I don't know what the password is either. I don't care because nobody's going to be accessing that through the login screen anymore. Okay, I'm gonna go on. We have just a few more things here. Um, I'm not, again, going to go through merging patron accounts. I already just said the things I wanted to say. Just some additional interfaces. Um, this is a very specific thing. This means that when the hold was placed by a patron, there was something that could fulfill it. And since that time, the hold has not been filled and something has happened that has made it unfillable, meaning that the item, perhaps that uh, there was only one item available for it and went to the shelf to pull it and it was missing. And now all of a sudden there's nothing that can fill it um, or something has been damaged, marked to lost, any number of those things. And so what this interface does then is say, this hold has been placed, it is hopeless, and then that is meant to prompt you or whoever fills this to action. This is not an exclusively local admin thing, but it is located here in the local administration menu and something to keep an eye on and know that it exists. The next thing is patrons with negative balance. Again, this is a kind of a canned report. And the thing that you want to see here is absolutely nothing. Uh, and by and large, when you go here, you're going to find nothing. If there is a patron here with negative balances, then again, that's gonna be a reminder to spur you to some type of action. Maybe some billing needs to be added. Maybe there um, was some 
um, idiosyncrasy going on in between a an automatic uh, bill forgiveness and a counter bill forgiveness and all of that. So this is just going to spur you to action. Almost always, this is going to have nothing in it, and that's good. Updated interfaces. We're going to talk about the library settings editor um, right now. But this is the last time, if you go in to do these things, that you will have to use our current interface because it's being updated. So these three places are being updated in the next version of Evergreen, Library Settings Editor, the Cache Reports, and the Statistical Categories. Library Settings Editor and the Statistical Categories, you do need to have local um, administration permission to utilize. And currently and in the future, you're going to access them right here. So I'm going to go to the current Library Settings Editor, and I'm going to also bring up our migration server, which has been updated to 3.11.1 plus. Let's see if it lets me log in like that. Nope. All right, so this is what the library settings editor looks like right now. So this is what it's going to look like. I'm gonna go ahead and make this bigger as well. I'm gonna go under local administration and we're going to go to library settings editor and this is what the new one looks like it's going to take just a moment to load there are still a ton of them but now i can do the same search so there are a list of library settings that should be reviewed regularly in your library. Um, by regularly, you decide what that means. Uh, if things are going as expected, maybe they don't need to be reviewed. But uh, this is, again, this is to remind you that these exist. And if you haven't thought about them in a while, today's the day. Think about them a little bit. Uh, these include the staff login and activity timeout. This is going to be for when does the staff client log out if nobody's using it. These are recorded in seconds. Um, the OPAC inactivity timeout, again, in seconds. This is important if you have um, public computers where people log in. Um, and then it is the tendency of all humans, I'm projecting myself upon you and everybody else, to log in, do a thing, and walk away. That final step of logging out is something that some people are very good about, but most people are not. And so to accommodate for that, we want OPAC inactivity timeout so that the next patron that walks up to that catalog is not automatically looking at the information, the transactional, um, history, those types of things for the patron that walked away. So you can just put in there timeout, or these are the actual uh, names of the setting. That So you could actually just copy paste that into this to avoid the slow typing search, just not the technical term, but nonetheless. Um, and to set this in. Now you'll see here for the consortial collection that's here at the State Library for our high holds collection, we don't have a staff login activity timeout because we work in a closed office environment. Uh, there's never public around here. We None of us share computer terminals or anything like that. And we are doing things that oftentimes take a lot of time and we don't want them to log out. But just for the heck of it. We also don't have people using our OPAC, uh, but we do have a setting in here and the way to set it, and I'm just gonna actually change this, is you're going to calculate the number of seconds. And I think, actually, I think it's there, five minutes. Uh, 
to do that. Now, maybe you have another setup in your library. Say you don't have any designated um, public catalogs. You just say people, hey, we have these computers. You use it for computing, and you can go to the OPAC there and, and do things like that. And you also have some PC management software that is going to automatically time patrons out, or you're using deep freeze that also is going to reset a whole session. Then this OPAC inactivity timeout is not as important. So it isn't important for you and your colleagues within your library to think about, okay, what is the environment in which our patrons are accessing the OPAC? What is the necessary time consideration here? Is there one? Um, and so consider that. So consider this your reminder. The most important thing in this list, however, is the last one. This sending email address for patron notices. There is a default in here. Um, any patron emails that are sent, um, as well as print notices, I believe, uh, say evergreen at evergreen.lib.in.us. That is an actual email, but it is to a place I don't know who has access to it and nobody checks it. And we do not respond to your patrons as if we can avoid it in any possible way. We always send them to you. Um, as as their library service provider. So this needs to be updated. And that's, and you can see here, and I just changed, well, I don't know why I changed that to Vetersburg, because we again don't send these out. So I could put in here, um, I'm not sure that I've made that email address yet, but. And so if we were sending out notifications, then it would come from there. Please make sure that this is updated for your library. Um, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but this is the one that by the end of today, I would challenge you to make sure that this is updated correctly. The next thing that is updated, uh, you may or may not use the cache reports um, in the interface. Um, uh, it is a nice update that has been added. So you can see what it, it looked like. Oh, take that back. I'll just show you here. This is what our cache reports look like right now. And I'm going to change this to a library that possibly has cache reports. Maybe I'll do this. Okay. So you can see here that this is what it looks like. It's not a very user-friendly thing. Um, and this is what the new cache reports are going to look like. We have uh, the, these new cache reports. So this can be very helpful. And you can see it's now split into a tab. It works the same, looks way better. It does have the new Angular features. You can add some more columns. You can also download things a little bit easier. Then we have the statistical category editor. Um, again, this is not something that gets used very often, but it gets used very purposefully when it does get used. You can see what it looks like right now, which it does work. Um, it is a bit of a pain to get in here. It's a little bit out of order, in my opinion, since you have the things that have been created. If you want to create something new, it's up top here. This is what it's going to look like in the new interfaces. There's going to be, there are two separate links, one for item statistical categories, and you can add a new stat cat here, and then you can edit entries over here. Of course, that one didn't have any entries, but um, and of course, I close my whole MIG there. Yeah. And then we also have uh, for patrons. Um, and so if I wanted to add a new library system in here, uh, change that. 
you can see this also has the updated um, organizational unit library selector called an org unit selector, but trying to change the terminology to library selector. I'm not going to go through how to submit a help desk ticket other than just a reminder of what I hope um, can become part of your mental triage when you're deciding to uh, put in a help desk ticket or not. Uh, keeping in mind that you, there's a point to where you don't have to do any mental triage. You just have to say, I don't know how to do something. Something is broken and just submit a ticket. And that is perfectly appropriate. You can find uh, the, in my opinion, again, the easiest way to access this is if you're in the client, there's a link right here. There's also um, a link right here. There is only one really important item in here that I do want you to think about, and that's to thoughtly, uh, thoughtfully determine whether or not this is an urgent ticket or not. When we are talking about urgent um, in Evergreen Indiana administration, we're talking about can you access the client and is it doing what it is supposed to do? If you're trying to save things, are they saving? Can you do the work of the library? If you cannot do the work of the library using the client, then that is urgent. If something is not as expected or um, you have a question, it's still going to feel urgent, um, but that would not be considered urgent for us. And this is why. When somebody selects that this request is urgent. That doesn't just send emails to all of us. And I will tell you, we're always monitoring the help desk. So all, everything is important that comes in there. there. It's not, is this important or unimportant? It is important. But when it's urgent, that also sends uh, calls out through our emergency line, sends text to advance support, and it does it all hours of the day. So if you are, we'll say, cataloging at 7.30 at night and there's no cover art and you put that in for the thing and um, that is marked as urgent, then that is texting multiple people with that help desk ticket as opposed to putting it in the inbox to be dealt with uh, when they come back into the office the next day. So just thoughtfully consider that. Um, if you don't know the answer, go ahead and select that it's urgent um, because again, it did feel urgent. Have a grand rest of your day. It's sunny, even if it's a little chilly. It's good to see you. Bye everyone. Bye.